This week we've decided to split the Cycling Podcast episode into two parts, and this is part one. You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freeb. Hello, Rich. Do I not? Am I um, not entitled to the usual introduction now that I'm in the same country you're, as you? You're in London, so no uh, more Daniele Freeb and Chini. Just just plain old just Daniel Freeb at the moment. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Hello. Well, I don't know about you, chats. I'm a bit. I'm a bit. Bit tired today. After I did a seven-hour, two hundred fifty no, kilometer. Didn't ride no, on didn't. the turbo trainer yesterday you absolute liar, liar. someone did though didn't guys. they who, who was it that well there have been a lot, Hessing. a lot of epic well, on the turbo trainer yeah but yeah, i mean but it was kind of virtual indoors, pseudo reality yeah. wasn't it he was practically as indoor cycling goes it wasn't really cycling. my vision of indoor cycling he's got he, he's got a setup on a on his terrace in andorra overlooking the mountains even you could overcome your your fear and loathing of Andorra, Lionel, with that sort of setup, I, I, I think. I was, um, as you know, I, I was a devotee of turbo training in my youth, as we touched on briefly last week. But um, I don't know if I'm going to upset any of our sponsors. I, I don't think I am by saying this, but I, I was shocked at how expensive turbo trainers are now. I, I um, had a quick look yesterday. Smart trainers. I would have to well, remortgage. I would have to remortgage the chateau to afford one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to say though, uh, and you know, just to just to repair some of the damage just done in the last few seconds by Daniel to any. We don't have um, a sponsor that makes. Smart no, we trainers, don't do currently. We, no, no, but it's a completely different experience. I mean, it's like comparing sailing with power boating. You know, it it going, going on a smart trainer is compared to a turbo trainer uh, is is. I mean, I I first used one I think eighteen months ago or so, and and I was blown away by the the different experience not not trying to sell them or anything but it is a completely different different thing now anyway um chaps how are you how are you both coping we're in, we're all we're all kind of locked down now it's a bit it's a bit vague and if there's a bit of noise here at my end from my house it's because the builders next door are carrying on regardless um which uh, is just sort of symptomatic of a certain vagueness in the UK but how are you both coping with uh, being housebound well, going back to the previous discussion about the turbo trainer, I mean, um, you know, smart trainers, um, they're, they're sort of, well, I'm probably infamous for not liking gimmickry and, um, you know, um, well, my loathing of indoor cycling is well known. But um, yeah, the sort of minimalist Spartan existence is something that sort of appeals to me anyway. I feel like I've been training for this for the last you know 10 years so it's not that much of a, of a readjustment for me um i mean on a, on a sort of serious semi-serious note um you know rightfully there's a lot of talk at the moment about and um, preserving sort of mental health and looking after people's mental health and you know the sort of debate about whether you should or shouldn't be riding a bike and exercising sort of feeds into that but um you know i think maybe what's being ignored slightly is that for some people's mental health this is probably um, quite salutary in the sense that you know the sort of introverts among us um, we're constantly trying to sort of dial down the level of stimulation and the, the number of decisions we have to make on a daily basis and you know from my point of view sort of going to a shop on the rare occasions that I do go to a shop and, and not really having any choice in the matter um, I find quite refreshing personally but I know that's not everyone's experience. Mm, interesting. I mean, I, I suppose we, well, we've all been freelancers for a long time, haven't we? I think I'm I'm kind of used to working on my own at home. Um, I suppose having having my family here all the time is the, the thing I'm adjusting to because normally I would be able to, um, you know, lock myself away and 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 carry on working. Uh, now I have to consider other people, which is, I mean, you know, difficult. It doesn't come naturally, does it? No. <laughs> no, thanks, Rich. And so, yeah, I've got an 18-month-old running about in the garden. From my point of view, the turbo trainer's set up, ready for uh, a spin this afternoon. I'll, I'll probably reactivate Zwift, um, which I've used before. Speaking of which, Mitch Docker's Life in the Peloton episode this week will be worth listening to as we all adjust to training indoors. Uh, 
Um, it's with his coach, Kevin Poulton, who was also Matt Heyman's coach in 2016. 16? Yeah, when Heyman crashed at Omloop Het Newsblad, looked like his classic campaign was over, but he trained indoors on Zwift and won Paris Bay. And it's kind of the, the story of, um, of, of slightly of that, but, but more from the kind of the, the benefits of indoor training. Uh, so that's worth listening out for. Uh, that will be released on Wednesday, Life in the Peloton on our feed but from my most from my own point of view i will probably point the um the turbo trainer and the bike so that i can look out of the back door of my office into the garden and um and, and maybe as the temperatures warm up might even move the turbo outdoors onto the onto the decking and just uh, that's a good idea just why on not? the on the turbo training um there was a, a really good interview that Thibaut pino did with uh, france television um, yesterday in which he talked about turbo training and he, he's a sort of savage forest dweller like myself you know uh, man of the natural world and he's not really um, he, he's not really into smart trainers and so on but um, he did make a point that I've not sort of considered before that um, you sweat an awful lot um, when you are using the turbo trainer and he said you you lose so many mineral salts that if you do very very long sessions um a lot of very long sessions it's actually very bad for you but i presume there are ways to compensate for that um proper hydration well yes indeed um early plug for science and sport um well listen let's let's get into this week's probably a very long episode um and you know there's a challenge for us in this in this period but it's it's an opportunity as well and we're aware that some of you will be listening to the cycling podcast to get away from uh, as a release from news of coronavirus but equally some of you will be listening to hear the latest news about uh, coronavirus as it, as it relates to professional cycling and how it's affecting riders, teams and races. So we're going to try and balance our coverage over the coming weeks starting today, reflecting on some past races, fresh interviews with some of the, the riders caught up in this. Um, and in this spirit, in the first part of this episode, we're going to be talking about all things Milan San Remo, reliving last year's win by Julian Alaphilippe with his teammates Tim de Klerk and Zdenek Stebar. We'll also later on be hearing from Marco Pinotti, the former rider who's now a CCC coach. Um, did I say CCC coach? Who lives in Bergamo, which is the, the current epicentre of the coronavirus crisis. We've also got an interview with EF Pro Cycling boss, Jonathan Vauters about the latest developments. Uh, we'll also get the first instalment of Lockdown with Larry. That's Larry Warbass of AG2R um, with his thoughts about how he's dealing with with things. And that might become a regular feature. We're hoping to hear it from other riders as well uh, as this goes on. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that's, that struck me is that maybe now we can all relate to riders uh, who have a long-term injury. I was watching an old Milan San Rainbow video featuring Henrik Hausler and he was talking about being out of action and not really sure when or if he could come back and um, also uh, thinking about your revenant special with uh, Marco Haller and Bernard Eisel Daniel and um, you know the situation as things stand we're all kind of collectively out with a long-term injury or you know that's kind of what it feels like uh, and that sense of uncertainty and missing out and really missing it um, is something we can probably all relate to now a bit, a bit better. Well, and I think particularly something that I've got from Heinrich Haus for the last couple of years, I mean, um, I think I talked about it on the podcast. I had a sort of chance meeting with him in Berlin a couple of years ago when he um, was pretty convinced that his career was over and um, just observing him and speaking, speaking to him over the last couple of years at races, um, he feels as though he's been given a sort of uh, a tenth life um, and um, he's going to, yeah, extract the, the absolute maximum from that and he, he really seems to be someone who's who's loving just being at races and being able to compete and being healthy again Daniel you, you say a chance meeting there I mean this is this is a spin-off series isn't it lunch it with is. I'll do I'll carry on with those eventually when we're all allowed to go out for lunch again and you Virtually can do virtual lunch yeah, virtual lunch you can and you can do chance meeting with so far exactly. we've got Degan Colburn and Hausler Mick Bennett Bennett, another Bennett, another I've... spin-off, uh, Turbo Training with Daniel Freib. Yes. Um, and actually, we've got a special episode coming up devoted largely to that. Um, more details to follow. Uh, we don't have a news roundup this week, but there is some news that we wanted to deal with at the start of the show, isn't there, Lionel? 
Yeah, very sad news that the uh, the veteran and very highly respected Italian journalist Gianni Mura, um, also known as Punto for reasons Danny will explain shortly, uh, passed away this week. And we're going to hear a little bit of Gianni Mura's voice here. Affermi che lo champagne è come una crono squadre. Lo champagne è fatto da, da di, in genere è il concorso di un uvaggio, cioè di diversi vitigni che sono lo chardonnay, il pinot nero, il pinot meunier sì. in, di base e ognuno ci mette del suo, ma a quella so That was the voice of Gianni Mura Chaps. Um, that was on an Italian uh, chat show a few years ago when he was being asked about his profession. He was asked, being asked about, you know, some of his writing and and this um, metaphor he'd come up with for um, team time trials and he'd like likened it to champagne because um, Champagne is made with three um, three grape varieties. One is Pinot Noir, Pinot uh, Meunier, and Chardonnay. And you know, Gianni was just sort of explaining there how um, in the Champagne region, those three grapes don't yield very much. They're not they're not all that great, or they wouldn't be um, as sort of single varietal wines. But you put them together, and they they add up to this. Um, you know, they can add up to this fantastic wine if they're sort of compensating each other in the right way. But that was sort of um, typical of of uh, you know the way he saw the world, the way he saw cycling. He was a real sort of bon vivant, a restaurant critic as well. Um, and it's just been um, it's been interesting to observe over the last um, couple of days since his death, just. How how much his work resonated um you know there's been there've been tribute videos from Michel Platini Platini the the French footballer who played in Italy in the 80s um and Gianni Mura covered um football as well and um you know to, for most of us who who have covered the Tour de France over the last um few decades uh, he was unmistakable um he became famous for being the last journalist certainly at cycle races to use a, a typewriter uh, he used an Olivetti 51 I think or 51 or 53 um, machine which which you know in itself became this sort of mythical object in the in the press room you would hear him tapping away you would see him there um, often surrounded by food actually he, um, he would come in with a punnet always of of apricots or, or cherries um, and a bottle of red wine often as well and a real sort of throwback um, and that was when he was in the press room very often he'd be outside the press room because you could no longer um, smoke in Tour de France press rooms from I guess for quite a long time now so he would he would sort of take up residence just outside the press room um, and he'd be tapping away and um, you know file these these magnificent pieces which you know placed him in the, in the pantheon of of Italian sports journalism, which itself has a, a more literary tradition, I would say, than sports journalism in a lot of other countries. Um, some of the, well, the, the, the Giro d'Italia has been a real platform for that and has really showcased that. Some of the greats sort of novelists of the of the 20th century in, in Italy um, were dispatched to cover the Giro d'Italia uh, at times. And similarly, some of the 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 sports reporters um, were fated and sort of mentioned in the same breath as some of the the great novelists. Um, but the the other sort of idiosyncrasy, and um, for which Gianni Mura became very well known was um, was well, Lionel, you mentioned the the fact that the English press pack really had nicknamed him Punto, and um, the reason for this um, was that when he was filing his copy, so he would type type out his race reports on the on the Olivetti and then he would call the Repubblica was the the newspaper they worked for he'd call their copy desk in Rome and he would dictate the the piece and at the end of every sentence he would say punto this kind of exclamatory punto which is actually just a full stop in in um, Italian but I you know I vividly remember the first time that I I became aware of this it was the 2001 Tour de France and it was my first Tour de France and Gianni Mura was sitting in front of me and it was actually I think it was Bastille Day and there was a stage in the Vosges mountains and Ivan Basso who was riding his first Tour de France um, for Fassa Bortolo had got into a break with Laurent Jalabert and Basso had crashed onto uh, on a descent coming into the finish and that had allowed Jalabert to win easily but anyway I was sitting behind Gianni Mura and I remember him reading out the copy filing his copy and it, and it, in Italian the way you spell words is you, you say the names of cities so Ivan Basso became Imola Venezia Ancona Napoli 
Ivan Basso was Bologna, uh, Ancona, uh, Savona, Savona, um, Otranto, which is a place in Puglia. And um, yeah, he would do this with almost every word. <laughs> so it would be like, you know, someone was sort of reciting the stages of the of a Giro d'Italia for, for, you know, it would have half taken an hour. It took him forever. Brincini. It took him forever. But I was actually, I was curious because um, La Repubblica actually have their their um, archive online and I was curious um, as to whether I could find this piece um, that I'd heard him dictate and I just I just picked out a couple of lines um, as you know literally the lines I, I was listening to him dictate and he said um, if anyone's interested in a personal opinion at a difficult time for him Ivan Basso is a rider in this sport the lack of adjectives is a compliment if the way he rode wasn't enough this sentence at the finish line would suffice if my collarbone's not broken, I'll try again tomorrow. So, you know, that was kind of fairly typical of, of a lot of what Gianni Mura would write. A very sort of stripped down conversational style. But there was this great sort of wisdom. And also at times, you know, um, his, his writing could be sort of very sort of um, florid and, and expansive as well. But, but very often it was just sort of like sitting next to this, well, like sitting next to Gianni Mura, who had this sort of appearance of this kind of languid, weary old walrus who had sort of seen and, and done everything in sports journalism and he was he was a restaurant critic as well Daniel wasn't he did he not write restaurant reviews with his wife and all I know I didn't unfortunately wasn't able to enjoy his his great writing in Italian but uh, I, I do know that if we went into a, a restaurant and Gianni Mura was there that it was it was a good restaurant at the Tour de France yeah that became a sort of unwritten secret code um, in the press room where whenever you saw him um, at a restaurant that was always that was always a sign that you'd made a good choice um, I, I didn't know him particularly well I mean I was quite intimidated by him to be honest because you know I knew about his reputation I knew his writing and um, you know I, I, I mentioned how sort of languid he was but he was he was someone who could at times look like a bit of a curmudgeon if you didn't know him um, I think he was from what um, people who knew him better than I I did have told me he was actually a very warm individual um, but I was sort of sc scared to approach him sometimes and the one one occasion when I did um, was in a restaurant in the Pyrenees that he loved the Pyrenees um, he much preferred the Pyrenees to the Alps sort of famously um, and he was in this restaurant in the Pyrenees with uh, Francesco Guidolin who is a football a famous football manager in Italy and um, Guidolin used to come to the Tour de France to do a couple of stages um, and just watch Gianni Mura um, operate because that was a spectacle in itself. You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. I W O C A dot co dot UK. My name is James, James Turner. I am the IT manager at iWalker. Uh, super passionate about everything uh, to do with bicycles. I've been sort of following the industry uh, and racing uh, and taking part in racing um, for as long as I can remember um, and it, it's something that helps me keep uh, very much sane um, and unoccupied in my downtime. I love the fact that iWaka does get involved in in not just sort of straight business activities and, and iWaka as a company uh, we see ourselves very much as an enabler um, for other small businesses and so I do see the sort of the sporting angle of things being an enabler to society, if you will, uh, as very much more sort of just an extension on that and on that mission, if you will. We do have on staff quite a few talented athletes uh, from many different sports, um, but personally, sort of being very involved in, in cycling myself, uh, selfishly, I, I, I really enjoyed that sort of announcement. It was great for me to hear out of the blue um, from my friends in the marketing department uh, that they were thinking of getting involved initially uh, with cycling uh, and then seeing the additional activities that have come out of the department has been uh, it's just fantastic. When I said I needed you you said you Wouldn't always 
Well, a little tantalising clip there of a treat for you all at the end of this episode. Our good friend Francois Tomazo with a song linked to Milan San Remo, which he'll explain later and which we're about to talk about. But before we do, a quick thanks to our headline sponsor, Iwaka, whose support helps ensure that we can carry on as normal or as normal as possible at this strange time. Iwaka remains 100% focused on their mission to provide customers with finance they need to bridge cash flow gaps and make investments. winner of this race. What a finish we're going to have. The firemen are behind, pumping on the coal to try and catch Marino Argentan in front. Anybody with anything left in his legs wants to get within the shouting distance of this man on the descent of the Poggio. Kelly's going away. Kelly's going to get it. Kelly gets it. John Kelly, the winner. Attacchi con Bonne la ruota, Filippo Pozzato, ancora qualche metro di metri metro. ancora! Pozzato, Pozzato, vincere, Pozzato, subito! Buonina di Galicci, Rizzieni, una la notte me li sono, una la notte me li sono, una la notte me li sono. Hausler hat Milan San Remo winnen. Een Duitser, een Duitser. Of Cavendish, of Cavendish, of Cavendish, of Cavendish, this Cavendish. Foto finish. Foto finish. Avec quelle facilité. En même temps, on salue tout le monde 50 mètres avant l'arrivée. Marc Gomez. Ah oui, ah, ça, ça, on le comprend. Je n'en reviens pas, dit-il. Formidable. Formidable Gomez. Formidable Gomez. Well, without lamenting its absence too much, chaps, uh, that's what we missed at the weekend, Milan San Remo, a, a nice little uh, oral reminder of um, the great race, the first monument of the season, La Classicisma, La Primavera. Which nickname's the right one, Daniel? Well, definitely not the way you pronounce the first one, Napalm. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> La Classicisima. No, I, I, I much prefer La Classicisima to... La Primavera, to be honest. Well, the thing I love about Milan San Remo is that it's long enough to justify a cappuccino, an ice cream, and a pizza. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, other thing, order. the other thing, the other thing, just briefly about La Primavera, we didn't want to get into speculation about what you know rearrangement of the calendar, but um, it could no longer be no. La Primavera because um, I understand that the the date that's currently in mind um, for the res- rescheduling of Milan San Remo is mid September. That's what RCS are thinking about working on at the moment. So, no, we're not congratulating Niccolo Bonifacio for winning our imaginary Milan San Remo at the weekend. We, he was heavily tipped by you last week, Daniel. Um, but uh, ju- based, based on a chance encounter. That oh, was, yeah, that's that true. One, yeah. Didn't we? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, a yeah. Boulang, in a French boulangerie. I mean, not just based on that. He was also going pretty well. He was a decent, decent shout, actually. Uh, for for that, I would have thought. Um, but Julian Alaphilippe was the winner uh, last year, of course. Did you? A lot of people, I think, at the weekend watched last year's race again. Did you indulge in any kind of watching back of old Milan San Remo's? I did not. <laughs> I have done actually. Um, <laughs> well, I have done. I've I've been watching the last sort of fifteen kilometres of last year's race, and well, the 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 acceleration by Alaphilippe on the Poggio was quite something wasn't it um he wasn't quite able to get away from everybody quite a, a an A-list group sprinting for the win at the finish wasn't it it was a it was a, I would say a good addition I mean it's difficult now isn't it with without anything to uh, without a current race to talk about suddenly the 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 the, the, the you know the thrill and excitement of uh, last year's race has sort of earned another another wine glass on the Daniel Freeb um, spectrum of uh, bike races I think it's probably up to four and a half wine glasses now maybe it does it gives it it sort of amplifies it doesn't it in a way um, because the cycling season uh, being the way it is means that you move on we talked about this a bit last week Paris-Nice taking on new meaning meaning something in and of itself and 
the the way the cycling season is structured means that you're no sooner no sooner is a race finished than you're actually looking ahead to the next race. There isn't a lot of time to reflect uh, or to really sometimes appreciate um, the races and the performances that we've seen. No, and uh, well, Richard, you and I have spoken to a couple of Alaphilippe's De Kernin Quick Step teammates about last year's race, uh, Tim de Klerk and Stenjek Stibar, um, to attempt to not butcher the pronunciation of uh, the Czech rider's name. And uh, well, let's hear their memories of the race from 12 months ago. We should start by saying that Tim de Klerk, I managed to interrupt his. Uh, one of the many chores that he's uh, performing in this in this hiatus, he's paint, painting his house. So we hear him uh, mentioning that briefly at the start. For goodness sake, just just force the DIY stores to uh, close for all our sakes. <laughs> We've had a 10-man break since the start today. That has gone. Masnada was the last survivor. We then had an attack from Nicolò Bonifacio, the local rider, who will know those curves better than anybody else. He's just been taken back, and we're all back together. Yeah, taking the the rest periods I have normally after the classics and taking it now. So yeah, it's a it's a little bit more boring than uh, than otherwise. But my my wife gave me a lot of chores to do around the house. So for the moment, it has not been uh, boring yet. But still, I I miss it to to go outside and uh, and meet some friends. But it's the same for everybody, of course. I'm Tim de Klerk, uh, 30 years old and uh, domestic for uh, the Queen and Quick Step Saxon team. Um, I have to paint. I have to paint uh, the, 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 the room of, of the, the little girl we we're, uh, were expecting. And also I, uh, I clean the, the terraces I, and I clean the, the whole garden. Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to the 291 kilometers from Milan to San Remo on the home of cycling. It was one of the days, normally it's, there's always something that ruins the plan, but uh, this time uh, there was nothing except maybe for uh, Alaphilippe going, uh, going for a piss. Uh, 5k before the Cipressa. <laughs> that was maybe one of the things that could have ruined the plan, but he was he was so good and, and maybe uh, the weight he lost there helped him to, to, to perform even better uphill. So. Yeah, Milan Snoremo of last year was a really special race. Uh, I think also it was uh, one of the best team efforts um, I was ever in, in during the during the race. Um, because yeah, we, you know we had really uh, extremely good team on the start. Uh, we had Alia Viviani, who was uh, definitely in very good shape, and uh, we did believe that uh, he will get over Pojo and he can sprint for the win. Uh, we we had uh, Philip Gilbert uh, on the line, who was uh, really going for it also. Um, yeah, and then we had uh, Julia, who was uh, who was in yeah in excellent shape, winning Strada Bianca, winning uh, stage in Tirreno. And then, uh, yeah, so he was ready for San Remo as well. Um, what I remember was that um, before Cipresa, uh, uh, like 10 kilometers before, uh, Julian, uh, he said, oh, uh, I, I just need to, to have a pee. But, you know, he was, everybody was so stressed. Everybody was pushing themselves to be in the front and... Uh, don't miss the the important moment of the race because yeah for everybody Chipresa is uh, so important and he just decided he has to stop and uh, I was um, I was with him because uh, yeah I, I just tried to help him to to get back into the front so he had to be really confident my, my job was was uh, done after after Capo Berta but I was still in the peloton I said. Uh, uh, fuck what he was he doing now because everybody was fighting so much for position but uh, yeah the, the whole team stayed with him and I, I tried to bring him one last time to the front and uh, the other guys did, uh, did the rest and did, uh, did a perfect job Talked about Betiol in the past and how good he could be at this race but again a man who needs it to change in the move behind it's Julio Alaphilippe Alaphilippe lift off with Kwiatkowski following him uh, we got over to Fresa, like uh, without any problem, and then we were together also with Alia Viviani and uh, just before Poggio. But then on one of the roundabouts, um, 
uh, we got uh, in difficulties behind a small crash and uh, we were really far behind uh, the other teammates. They were on the right side, we were on the left side together and uh, trying to, to get to the front. So we lost each other again with Elia and afterwards we were trying again to get to the front and then again we lost each other and then we were like maybe 500 meters uh, in front of the right corner to Pojo where um, where we had a kind of uh, let's say meeting with the, with the other teammates that uh, that we will just go from there uh, very hard and that we will take Pojo on, on our, on our uh, own pace uh, so I had to move also to the front in the meantime I lost Elia uh, I could still make it to the front and uh, then actually I think it was Yves Lampard who, who bring us um, uh, into the first 100 meters of Pojo or maybe 200 and uh, afterwards I took over I said really hard pace uh, afterwards took over again Philip Gilbert and then me again and then uh, I was going as long as I could and then took over again Philip and uh, on the top yeah, uh, Julia went really hard and then just few riders could uh, or were able to to follow him. Julia Alaphilippe with still a bit to go towards the top of the Pojo. This is the point last year when Nibali went clear. This is the point where Nibali went clear. Now Kwiatkowski is chasing. Sagan, the man on the outside going as well. Trentin, also Narsen with Valverde just behind him. And there's a rider from Jumbo Visma. I, you know, on that moment when we hit Pojo, uh, I knew that Elia is a little bit uh, more far behind. And uh, and we set really very hard pace. We went just from the bottom, uh, really hard. We were like, we could even say that we were just sprinting from one corner to the other. And uh, so on that moment, I knew that uh, I'm really setting very hard pace for for Julian, but also that on the same time I'm killing Elia Viviani. To be very honest, I had more confidence in uh, in Elia than in Julian. But it was just somehow it came that uh, Julia he said, yeah, just guys uh, go as hard as you can. And uh, that's what we did. I knew that this pace, Elia can never, uh, never get over Pojo. So I was just hoping that uh, that Julian can finish it off. Mohoric, the Slovenian champion, being chased by Alaphilippe. 800 meters from the finish now as they come on to Villaroma. It's Mohoric on the right-hand side, Alaphilippe behind him, then Sagan. Is this the moment for him? Is this the chance? Sagan, in the meantime, is being followed by Narsen, also a fast finisher. Trentin is there, Fernand is there as well. Kwiatkowski behind him, while then are they always a danger? As Trentin looks round, they all look around. Now who goes? What happens? It's Czech. Mate, maybe, but somebody has to win it. Somebody has to make a move. And uh, yeah, then we were uh, kind of just waiting for the result in the radio. Um, and what was really amazing is that we did pass with several teammates um, over the finish line with a hands up, uh, like we were the winners. And we did really enjoy it so much because it was uh, an enormous. Uh, team effort uh, during the Sun Remo and especially the final of Sun Remo. Nibali at the back, just a few hundred meters away as Alaphilippe's going to have to launch it now. The end of Milano San Remo, the 110th edition. Alaphilippe is going first, they've gone up to the line. Alaphilippe still at the front, it's going to be him. Oh, he can't stop winning. Alaphilippe has it. Oh, he's, he's, he's a really nice guy to have in, in the team. It's always a lot of fun with him. And um, yeah, you can have a, a lot of laughs. And, and uh, he's also really grateful. Um, he's a guy that he, he's an extrovert. He, he, he's, yeah, he shows how he is. And, and yeah, it's, a, it's always a lot of fun uh, with him. Shoot à l'arrière du peloton, Cycling Podcast Team Car, the back of the pack, please.
The voice of Seb PK reminds me to tell you that this week's episode of the Cycling Podcast is supported by LACA. LACA is a community of cyclists all working together to ensure their bikes and equipment in the event of damage or loss. Ensuring the premiums are lower and the payouts in the event of a claim are swifter, you'll be dealing with people who understand bikes, who will know their Shimano from their SRAM, and that racing bikes and equipment can be expensive. Your premium depends, of course, on the value of your bikes and equipment, and it goes up or down depending on how many other claims there are but there is a ceiling to the monthly premium don't take our word for it let's hear from a satisfied LACA customer uh, my name's Dan I am a key, very keen but ultimately average road cyclist um, and I like to do a little bit of um, cyclocross and off-road stuff as well I've been a LACA customer for maybe two years now I've had to make uh, one claim and it was really really straightforward and had the sort of uh, the money come through to to um, get all of the replacement parts within a couple of days I think I had um, another rider into the back of me and put a, a fairly large dent and a split into the fender on the bike I was running an aluminium fender so couldn't pop them back and there was a sort of crack across the, the uh, where the bridge mount was as well um, and they were sort of fairly expensive fenders that I imported from the US and um, the guys at LACA just um, uh, allowed me to buy another pair and just uh, gave me the cash for the, the actual fender and the, the, the um, postage over as well so that was all good they literally just I, I sent them uh, the uh, pricing to show how much it was from the website and they just transferred the money to my account. I think it was the following day and I just ordered the parts that I needed and got my mechanic to uh, to fit them all on, back on for me. If that sounds like the sort of bike insurance you'd like, then please go to laka.co.uk. That's L-A-K-A dot co dot UK. Well, that was Tim DeClerc and Zdenek Stebar. Um, DeClerc, of course, the big tall rider that we see sitting on the front for many, many kilometres, uh, helping control things for De Kooning, quick steps. Steve Barr, a um, bit of a you know winner in his own right and a, a, a more valuable um, teammate for Julian Alaphilippe towards the end of Milan San Remo last year. But I was, I was interested, I didn't know about Alaphilippe stopping to answer a call of nature just before the Cipressa, um, which uh, was, was new to me, but um, clearly in, in great form. And as de Klerk said, perhaps the the loss of that weight helped him ultimately over the Cipressa and the the Poggio. But you know, I mentioned I watched back the race again. And it, you know, De Clerc said that they had a plan to to really go all in for Ala Philippe instead of Philippe Gilbert and Elia Viviani, both potential winners as well. And you know, watching it, you could see Gilbert really committing to that, um, and Viviani being sacrificed in trying to to, to help uh, Ala Philippe win the race. Yeah, it was interesting, Stibar saying that he still felt that Viviani, you know, going into the Poggio, still felt that Viviani might be the better bet. One thing that struck me, chaps, as well, just listening to that again, um, I don't don't think I'd fully appreciated at the time what an absolute dream team that was. Um, If you were going to design a team to win Milan San Remo, you would probably, well, you would have that kind of makeup that the Koenig Quick Step had. Um, last year just in terms of having a sprinter's option having someone like Tim DeClerc who could uh, you know act as the sort of lawnmower on the front of the the peloton for much of the day um, and then Ala Philippe as well the, the other thing um, it just popped into my head when, when you were mentioning Ala Philippe stopping before the Chipretto it's, it's, it's th- th- there are quite a number of important bike races um, won in, in similar circumstances when people seem to or riders seem to harness adrenaline um if they have either an enforced stoppage due to a a mechanical or you know a natural break before an important phase of the race i just just wonder whether surprised that that you're bringing this up daniel well it it might actually have helped alaphilippe um yeah i'm i'm now thinking about remember the did it turn out to be a spurious theory we had about balka molima stopping um deliberately 
before the climbs in the Giro That's d'Italia. Right. I think it was actually, yeah. I think I, I don't think it was spurious. I think it was true, but he didn't particularly want to dwell on it. Yeah, was that not, was he not using that to sort of help warm up to sort of, you know. He was. Also, did the weather have a factor in that? I can't remember. It was quite cold at the Giro, wasn't it, last year? Yes, but if you, if you just think about the sort of yeah. last 60 kilometres or last 40 kilometres of Milan San Remo, they are pl- pure adrenaline, really, aren't they? Um, and it's a, it's a race that sort of, well, not just metaphorically, but literally kind of moves through the gears um, as as it goes on. And, you know, it's it's a, a mysterious sort of nebulous art winning Milan San Remo. Um, there are so many great riders, great classics riders who have never managed to win it um, despite having been in in with a shout and in the right position seemingly P- Peter on, on Sagan. a number of occasions Peter Sagan, Sagan is, um, is one um, you know I, I talked at length to Mark Cavendish of course uh, a former Milan San Remo winner um, a, a year or two ago and you know he just talked and he always talks about the economy and, and how some riders go a whole career and they never really appreciate that I mean he said that it's a race where every single thing you do from the moment you leave Milan matters going over a drain cover on the left of the road versus the smooth tarmac in the middle can be the difference between you winning and losing he also talks about it being a, a race whose outcome is made of can be made of sort of thousands of pixels as opposed to sort of a hundred in in any other race one of my favorite Milan San Remo memories though Daniel is of Cavendish's win in 2009 I was watching it with with a, 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 a sports writer who had been working with Mark Cavendish on his first book and uh, oh, this really? book, this book had been, I think, more or less finished. It was more or less finished, and it was off, almost off to the printers. Um, I know what's coming. When we were watching, oh, oh, really? watching Milan San Remo <laughs> in what, an Italian and cafe in London. And uh, the minute, of course, I mean, Henrik Hausler went early, and it looked like Hausler had it, and then uh, out, out popped Cavendish and won the race. And this, and, this, and this well, world, presumably this he well, was jubilant. This well, he was jubilant. This well-known sports writer's head just fell into his hands, and he uh, he might have in, started crying. In he might have started crying at that point, thinking about the, 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 the structural sort of... structural problems this would give him with this book. <laughs> Yeah, did he say all of that in a Coventry accent? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said a few, a few, a few Italian swear words, some, uh, some, 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 some elaborate hand gestures. Uh, that's the uh, that's the ghost writing equivalent of the the sort of injury injury time goal yeah. in a Champions League final, isn't it? Um, just uh, lis- listening to uh, De Klerk and Stibar talking about Alaphilippe. Uh, victory last year obviously a French winner and uh, uh, Alaphilippe stopping to answer the call of nature uh, before the Cipressa made a a couple of things uh, pop through my mind uh, hearing them speak but uh, looking back through the list of winners Frenchmen to have won Milan San Remo going back in time 2016 Arno de Mar and his amazing car allegedly um, he well, won. another another example possibly depending on whose version you believe of you know someone having had a bit of a setback before the Cipressa and then um, again maybe maybe harnessing the power of adrenaline mm. or harnessing the horsepower of a team car I don't know I don't know I don't know well yeah the horsepower of the team car uh, uh, allegedly uh, st- strongly denied by uh, Francis De Jure. Um before that you have to go back to 1995 Laurent Jalabert and before that 88 and 89 back to back wins for Laurent Fignon and the reason I'm kind of getting uh, going a sort of circuitous route to this anecdote um, the 19 19- 1982 Milan Sanremo won by a, a at the time little known Frenchman Mark Gomez uh, actually his pa- parents were Spanish but he was uh, born in Rennes so a, a Breton uh, that was the first year that Milan Sanremo um, included the Cipressa in the route now Daniel I don't know whether you know more about this particular story than I do but uh, perhaps this might be one of those myths but as I understand it Vincenzo Torriani was the was the, um, the, the 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 boss of the day the uh, Mauro Veni of of the day a, a much more uh, forthright character from everything I've read than than Benny who's a bit of a shrinking violet it seems to me anyway but Torriani was nicknamed the bull uh, Toro the bull a play on his surname but also his 
character apparently and uh, the early 80s was the, the the kind of the peak of the Francesco Moser and Giuseppe Cerrone era the two um, the two great Italian riders but Torriani was getting a bit fed up with the formulaic finish to Milan San Remo and particularly the lack of Italian victories I think they'd only had two Italian wins in the previous 11 years and uh, Fons de Wolf's win a Belgian rider um, in 1981 was sort of the last draw for Torriani so um, he and his team set about trying to make the finale of the race more difficult and uh, the Cipressa climb which is at uh, is it called San Lorenzo al Mare Daniel the, the yes, town yes it is um, the, where the Cipressa starts you take a, a right turn off the road and it and it rises quite attractively up ahead of you and then there's another right hand turn taking you a, a kind of away from San Remo as it, as it doubles back and it's a, just under six kilometre climb and uh, Torriani wanted to include the Cipressa in the route um, it was pointed out to him that, it, that this would add more than 20 kilometres to the route, taking it over 300 kilometres in length, which might be unpalatable to some. So Torriani's answer to that was simply just to print all the race literature, the maps and the routes with a more acceptable distance of 294 kilometres. And of course, no one had a, a computer or, a, uh, or, or anything to track the distance so it was taken as read that it was it was 294 kilometers but legend is that it was at least five or six kilometers over 300 yeah this was a theme in uh, Torriani's Giri uh, when he was the Giro director for well many um, I think for about four or five decades wasn't he Um, he was infamous for yeah drawing up these routes and, and putting these climbs on the on the route which were nothing like um, they appeared on paper when the riders got to them. And yeah, the riders um, always took great exception to this and um, he became a bit of a divisive figure, didn't he? But um, they'd, they'd done the same with the, the Poggio in 1960 um, and that was, was sort of brought in um, to end a run of sprint finishes. Um, and the Cipresa, it's, it's funny, I, I wrote about the Cipresa in um, my book, Mountain High, a few years ago. but um, And I remember going through the press cover Coverage leading up to that 1982 race and what most of the the main protagonists main favorites for the race were talking about was the the descent that they thought that would have a bigger impact on the race than the actual climb and you know I, I think it does have a big effect on the, or the climb does have a big effect on the final outcome but not one that you will necessarily easily discern um watching we've very rarely seen attacks on the Cipressa succeed um, and, and a rider or a group um, go away on the Chipres and then stay away to the finish. Well, the winner, the winner that year was Mark Gomez, as I said. I mean, he was a first-year professional. He was 26, so he turned pro pretty late. Uh, probably thought his chance had passed him by. He'd been third in the French Amateur Championships the year before and signed for a small team, Wallaber, the the people who make tyres. Um, a huge field that year, over 250 on the start line. I think only around 80 finished. But again, a kind of uh, almost anachronistic these days a field of that size setting off for for the race and um well not knowing many people gomez uh went to uh, a fellow breton on the start line um to ask for a bit of advice and and he was basically told just just go hard from the start and get in the early break and that's what he did and uh for a long well he was out there all day he was with alain bondu a much better known frenchman and uh gomez pulled off what you know a bit like a sort of non-league team winning the fa cup really um a real shock uh, surprise win and uh, in fact well I, I wrote a collaborative piece with some other um, journalists when I worked work for Cycle Sport magazine about this particular edition of the race and one of the one of the comments that kind of stood out one of the quotes from Gomez that stood out was that he he says he rode down the Via Roma in to almost silence because no one knew who he was uh, you know there was no, uh, no no great kind of fanfare um, because uh, well I don't know whether it's the same these days but certainly it feels like in those days uh, the Italian and victors um, got much more of a uh, much more of a fanfare from the fans than than uh, basically a, a, an unknown rider. But uh, yeah, uh, one of those editions of Milan San Remo that sort of sticks in my memory. Even though you know I don't remember watching it at the time. It's uh, there is some footage on YouTube which um, we'll we'll post a link to that in the episode notes so that you can watch a little bit of what we're talking about in this episode. Uh- 
and, and I, I can well imagine that scenario, um, Napalm, of, of Gomez sort of riding uh, over the finish line in almost silence because you, you get w- well, one of two things happen after the finish line in Milan to Roma. If the, there's an Italian winner, um, they get mobbed and there's a huge stampede and things become very fractious. Um, the 1993 edition, for example, this led to a... This led to a, a sort of traffic jam of team cars um, as they were coming over the line and Mario Cipollini got extremely angry with the, the race director then, um, Carmine Castellano, and threw his bike through his windscreen. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the, the, all the sort of worst cliches of Italians and Italians at bike races come to the fore. So, you know, there's a lot of swearing, a lot of people getting angry. Or um, riders just carry straight on through and, and Via Roma actually continues, well, it goes way out past or the Via Aurelia, which Via Roma is part of, it continues way out through, well, past the old train station in San Remo. And almost, well, if you continue, you, you end up basically at the French border. And um, and it, 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 if you're a journalist there trying to stop riders, it can be a bit of a nightmare. I mean, I've run a couple of kilometres after riders in the past, but um, there is also this sense that, you know, the race is, is over and everyone just sort of gets gets out of dodge straight away almost they don't even get off their bikes it almost feels like in in some cases um you know i i mentioned talking about mark cavendish who's who's now a famous um winner of milan san remo um and i asked him you know what he knew about san remo apart from the fact that he's he won this famous edition in 2009 and 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 he knew very very little he knew that san remo had a famous music festival um which which most of the riders will know i guess but he he couldn't really say anything else And, and i said well have you ever spent any time there and he said well i think i had dinner there once and it wasn't very good but that's that's all and um, that's fairly typical, I think. You know, the riders, obviously, they arrive in Milan a couple of days before the race. And then as soon as they cross the finish line, they get to a hotel a kilometre or so from the finish line, pack up their stuff and off they go. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by Science. Uh, well, my name's Chris Hoy. I'm a six-time Olympic gold medalist and an 11-time world champion. The key thing that, that people ask me, what you know, advice, tips for beginners or, or amateurs, you know, maybe doing a, a charity ride or a sportive or a big challenge, the biggest thing I would say is don't try something new on race day or on the, the day that you're doing your challenge. Always train using the same products, using the same routine that you do, that you plan to on race day. Because you, the one thing you don't want to change with your digestive system when you're perhaps a bit nervous or a bit anxious on the, the big day is to try something different. And, you know, it's just, it is a classic mistake. You think, oh, here's all the gels. I'm going to keep them for a race day. Get used to using them in, in, in training. Plus, you benefit from it in training too. You, you want to get the benefit leading up in the preparation. It's not just about the race day itself. So, yeah, I learned that the hard way many times, you know, thinking I'd, I'd sort of save my, my good stuff for the for the big race. Um, and with a few nerves, you're, you're butterflies in the stomach, um, yeah, you can find yourself dashing to the loo seconds before you're supposed to be on the start line. Thanks very much to Science in Sport for their support of the cycling podcast. And, uh, well, you can get 25% off with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Very much business as usual for science and sport. And if you are doing more indoor cycling, as most of us are, um, the hydro and immune range fits perfectly for indoor training. So check that out at scienceandsport.com. As I think you were saying, yes. Daniel, earlier on, how important hydrate hydration is. Um, so... Uh, that is the key thing if you're spending a lot of time training indoors. Uh, you mentioned the 1993 Milan San Remo. That was my always my favourite edition, partly because I was a big fan of Maurizio Fondrias. Had a picture of him on my wall from behind on the descent of the Poggio. He attacked uh, quite similar to Vincenzo Nibali's attack uh, a couple of years ago to win. Um, Fondrias was. Uh, was in that kind of classic lamprey kit, the purple and pink kit, and um, really sort of savoured his win on the on the finishing straight. Um, I, I don't think I'd watched the race uh, again, and I watched it on the Turbo Trainer yesterday. Um, and you know, it was a fairly, in a way, bog standard edition of, of the race. But he really milked his uh, victory uh, coming to the finish, and I think that I think that's what caused the the pile up behind him because, as you say, Daniel. Italian riders especially were absolutely mobbed as they crossed the line 
there was a real um, kind of the real congestion. Loads of motorbikes. Loads. It looked like a motorbike race. Also, a very podgy uh, Lance Armstrong on the attack on the Cipressa in that race. Um, but Fondres's descent of the Poggio is one of the more famous ones. Perhaps, perhaps not the most famous. Lionel, you know a lot about the most famous descent of the Poggio, arguably the most famous descent of the Poggio. Wow, well, yeah, the, the, from the year before, 1992. I was going to just pick up on something Daniel said uh, about the 82 edition and the, the importance of the descents, because Gomez, Mark Gomez, the Frenchman, probably owed his victory uh, as much to the fact that Alain Bondu crashed twice on the descent of the Poggio. And one other thing that was unusual about that year, or something that sort of leapt out to me, um, you know, thinking about how now every Everybody knows every metre of road, uh, and if they don't, they go and check it out. Um, basically, none of the riders we spoke to for this feature um, went and checked out the Cipressa beforehand. You know, there wasn't a kind of a there's a new climb in the Milan San Remo course, so we all must go and learn uh, learn what it's like. A, a, a sort of different time, of course, then. But yeah, you're, you're right, Rich. The 1992 uh, Milan San Remo was kind of Sean Kelly's final hurrah. He just joined the Festina team from PDM. Uh, he was in the sort of autumn of his career. And, uh, well, Tom Wally has made uh, this really nice little package, which is uh, made up of some interviews that I did when I was working with Sean Kelly on his autobiography several years ago and uh, some of David Duffield's commentary from Eurosport. So Eric Boyer, it is... Switching up now on towards the Poggio climb. Chosen the right time to go at the front. This is the Poggio climb. Are you obviously on a good day? Yes. I'm good in Torino. You were good in Torino, but yeah. not... Uh... I never showed my card. Very good. Crash twice. Well, we've got tangled up in crashes. Broke two bikes. Had a bike which was... A I think it was a centimetre and a half too big for me, right. going to Milan San Rio. Really? Yeah. So you rode a bike that was too big? Back comes uh, Yakimov plowing his way up here. He's looking back, I think, to see where Fondris has got to. He's just working at the moment as a, a domestic, and it looks like he's got uh, Muzio on his wheel, wheel as well for Lotto. Great sprinter, Muzio, and that uh, would be danger, I think, if Yakimov towed him right toward the top. So all he's got to do is nullify Boye. Just grab him now, and I think he's about to do that. Hello. As he eases, again, it's Ariostia and it's uh, Argentan putting on the pressure at the front. Collage. Well, Argentan looks extremely worried, I think, at the moment. He can't break this feel up and one by one his teammates seem to have disappeared under the pressure. And they pull back Boyer on that sharp hairpin. Anybody else can have a go, and it's Ardentown as he side not to wait for the sprint, he's rocketing off the front. This is the move by Ardentown, can the rest match his move? Can the rest stay with him? Ardentown then, going away at the front. Well, on the Poggio, as we came to the Poggio, you know, Argentine was there and I could see them. It was 10 places out in front, and I said, this guy is going to, he's going to give us some kick in here. Right. And I said, I said to myself, I have to stay in 10 position, 15 position. And when, the, when he's going to attack, there's always going to be two or three cowboys who go with. Mm -hmm. And uh, they go with, then they get to him, and then they slow down and you know, come back as often with the podium. So I said to stay with that sudden acceleration. I said, I better stay away from that because if you do that three or four times. It has absolutely broken apart the seams. And Jim van der Leer has gone as Argentan has put in another attack. This man is formidable. He's got the power, he's got the pressure, he's got the few yards lead on Jim van der Leer. Look at that almost nonchalant. He looks back to see Raul Alcala coming up as well. I, you know, I said to myself, now I'll just move up and I'll go for the descent. Because I said to myself, you know, there'll probably some of the sprinters, if they're not there, they will come back on. And I said, I'd hit him immediately on the descent. And Sean Kelly is chasing down Argentan, and he's closing the gap. That is certainly not 15 seconds. It's coming down, and it's Kelly that's going after Argentan. And Argentan knows he can look back and realises, having been seen up the swirls, that he was opening a gap, that somebody's coming to, and that man is Kelly. And I said, at least 30 seconds. And then I went, before we left, I tried to go through, but Sorensen closed me. Right. You see me coming and he closes. Mm -hmm. So I just got up going to the corner and uh, then around the 
the right, left and then the right hander and then the right hander I went immediately mm. on the on his right side. He tried to close me a bit, but I just pulled those through. Kelly now began to wind it up. Adam Tammy in front of him. I could see the group coming. So when he looked around I moved well out so he could see that I wasn't blocking his vision. Yeah. And I said to myself that would put him in panic. it was, you know, not a lot. Because on the classic, if you win a classic, there was a big bonus. Oh right. And I put I put the helmet on before the sometime before the the, the Capo Belt and Capo Mali. Right. Only the last okay. fifty feet. So you only wore it for the last bit. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Ever the business. <laughs> Well, two things to note there. First of all, my interviewing technique, which was not for a podcast, so I'm kind of um, mm-hmm, uh-hum uh, through the through the interview as uh, encouraging Sean Kelly to open up a bit. Uh, sometimes a bit so, like so sometimes does need a bit of encouragement, anyway. doesn't he? <laughs> does a bit, and uh, bless him, David Duffield. I mean, the voice of uh, the voice of cycling for many of us who are watching through the late eighties, nineties, and and up to the, probably the end of the nineties. But the pronunciation police would have been dishing out a few fines there I think um, but the, the, that that Milan San Remo was all about Kelly's descent and the, and making the calculation as he would say in his commentary knowing that Argentina had gone over the top of the Poggio with uh, supposedly a 13 second lead or that was, at least was the information that he had and then plummeting down the other side um, but typical Sean Kelly really the the, the photos of the finish uh, they stick in my mind because Kelly is wearing a dreadful helmet apologies to Brancale who made the helmet but it looked like a pudding bowl there's no two ways know, about that's it that's us lost terrible thing. trainer sponsors helmet sponsors <laughs> Well, they've obviously the designs have improved over the years, haven't they? But uh, uh, typical that um, Kelly was was due a big sponsors bonus if he won a classic wearing the helmet, um, but he only put it on for sort of the last forty kilometres or so. Rode the rest of the race uh, bareheaded, um, as as they could in those days. So ever the businessman, as I said. Well, you, you mentioned the descent there, the the Poggio, um, Napalm, and, and also Fondius in '93. Um, Fondrius, I, I think his his wife had given birth the previous night, um, and he'd not yet met, he'd not yet seen his baby. I think it was a baby daughter, um, but he was sort of in this state of euphoria, and and it was it was the 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 peak, the pinnacle of his career, really, wasn't it? At that point, it looked as though you know he was sort of going to dominate one day races for the next few years, and then he had a lot of back problems which hindered him. But um, another rider who for whom the the Poggio was absolutely crucial was Vincenzo. Vincenzo Nibali a couple of years ago in 2018, not in the way that uh, many people perhaps would have expected before San Remo, before that edition of San Remo, if you'd said Nibali was going to win it, you might have expected the attack to have come on the po- on the Poggio descent or on the Chipressa descent. It actually, um, well, he attacked um, initially marking a move from Chris Nalance, the uh, Latvian champion. He went after Nalance on the Poggio and then, you know, they got a decent gap and, and Nibali sort of forged on and one on his own on the Via Roma. And this week, uh, Nibali, who, like every other rider at the moment, um, is not racing. Um, he did a little press conference on Facebook, um, and um, we submitted a couple of questions. And um, they were about Milan San Remo, the edition that he won 2018. And um, this is what he told us about you know, why it was exactly that, having tried for many years to go away on the Poggio, he finally succeeded in 2018. I factors decisive for the victory were stati. Uh, what I think was decisive was just being able to ride with a really clear head, stress-free. 
I was only there in a team role to help Colbrelli, and I only had two possibilities, to try on either the Poggio or the Cipressa if there were other attacks. That was the key point. Then, as soon as I went, I felt that I had the form, the strength to win, and I didn't get overexcited. I stayed cool and just said to myself, yep, I can win this. I also knew that my team were covering for me behind. When Chris Nalance went away, I got onto his wheel, then looked around and realised that I'd gone at the right time. That was Nibali about the 2018 Sanremo uh, Chaps, definitely one of the highlights of his career. I think a, a win that sort of took him into a different uh, dimension. Of course, his Tour of Lombardy um, win came after that as well. So, you know, he went from being one of the best Grand Tour riders of his generation to one of the best riders, certainly full stop, of the last you know, few decades really but um, a couple of other things that came out of that little Nibali press conference the other day um, he was asked as you would expect about the Giro which was supposed to be his objective big goal of 2020 um, and he he expressed the opinion that uh, a shortened Giro would not really be a proper Giro and that he um, didn't really seem very enamoured with, with that idea that's going around at the moment. Just the latest on that front, I understand RCS, the Giro organiser, working on a few things. Um, one idea was for the Giro to start on the 2nd of um, June, which is actually a sort of national holiday, the sort of national holiday to celebrate the Republic of Italy. Um, and, that, and that would have been quite symbolic because it would, probably would be a Giro that would be entirely in Italy, um, obviously um, Hungary um, was where the Giro was supposed to start this year but it seems possible that we could have a Giro without the Hungarian Grande Partenza so that was one idea another possibility is maybe running parallel to the Vuelta and then a third possibly at uh, this stage the most likely option um, could be an October uh, Giro d'Italia Hi guys, this is Larry Warbass and uh, you are listening to Lockdown with Larry. <clears throat> so, currently not actually locked down um, because I am traveling back to the US. So, I am at London Heathrow Airport and uh, just awaiting my flight first to Chicago and then home to Traverse City, Michigan. So, it was uh, very much a last minute call. I had planned to stay in France and uh, wait out the lockdown there, but <clears throat> it just seemed like with each coming day, there wasn't really a whole lot of positive news coming. And if you saw what was happening in Italy and Spain, it sounded like uh, France could get worse as well. So um, I didn't really want to take any chances of potentially being locked down in my apartment or at altitude by myself um, and yeah, potentially being locked down for like a couple months alone, uh, which would not be ideal, especially if you couldn't ride your bike outside. So, um, so yeah, we, I was, uh, I was actually at altitude with uh, Will Barda, another American who rides for CCC when, yeah, we, we, we had planned on staying there for, <clears throat> you know, the two week lockdown that was the initial plan in France. Um, and then we thought we would probably go back to our apartments in Nice. But yeah, Will heard from a friend that there was potentially uh, stricter measures coming in France, which, you know, it's really hard to say if that's just a rumor or not, but uh, I didn't want to take a chance uh, that it it wasn't a rumor and uh, then have some regrets potentially for the rest of my life if uh, yeah, if I got locked down so long alone. So, um, so yeah, we made the decision come back to the U.S. as soon as, as soon as I heard, I went straight, booked a ticket for the next day out, the soonest flight I could find home. And uh, yeah, now I'm uh, on my way back to the U.S. So, so yeah, it's definitely been been a bit of a crazy 
actually last couple weeks because uh, I was at UAE tour um, where we also got temporarily put on a lockdown or quarantine inside the hotel. Um, luckily, that one only lasted two and a half days and most of us were able to get out. Some other guys weren't as lucky and they were there for two weeks. So um, that definitely gave me a little scare at the start and it was a little bit of foreshadowing of what was to come in Europe. So when we were there, we all kind of thought, eh, we could see we could see this going on a lot longer. Um, we could see this potentially meaning the cancellation of some races in the spring and potentially the whole spring season. And while we were saying that to each other at the time in UAE, uh, I don't know if we truly believed it, but sure enough, that's what has come to pass. And, uh, and yeah, um, I don't think there's anyone in the world who expected this and yeah, it's pretty crazy. So obviously it's much bigger than cycling and, the way I see it is, is, you know, I've got to do what's best for uh, mental health right now. And, you know, that's definitely going home and spending this time with my family because uh, no one knows how long this is going to last. And I'm guessing it's going to be a couple months. So at least uh, if I'm with, you know, my loved ones and uh, yeah, at home, I'm sure it'll get uh, tense at times, but uh, but at the moment, everyone can exercise alone in the U.S., um, and I think that's a really good thing for the head. So, you know, I'm looking forward to going there, riding my bike outside, keeping my distance from people, and, uh, and yeah, just holding up at my parents' house. Uh, I told my mom that she can't cook too much good food, maybe like a day or two, you know, get, uh, get all that yummy, yummy good stuff in, but... You know, I don't want to, like, come out of this quarantine, like, 10 kilos too heavy. So, I'm sure we'll race our bikes sometime again. And uh, got to be in a good good shape uh, to be ready for that whenever it comes. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it for the moment. And uh, hopefully there will be more positive news to come. We'll see. So yeah, I guess to further describe, uh, I was at altitude because I had actually planned uh, a training camp to get ready for Tour of the Basque Country and um, the Ardennes Classics after that with an eye towards the Giro. So I had booked an altitude camp at Isla 2000, a place that we go quite frequently. And yeah, Will Barda and I, we went up there. So actually, as planned, and the only race that I had missed up until now was Strada Bianca. Um, so pretty much, if you just took everything away, most things were continuing on as normal. But yeah, we we rented this place for two weeks. I had actually already been there um, five days before the real like lockdown began in France, and I had been training. And we just decided to stay up there rather than go back to Nice when the lockdown started because uh, we thought maybe just being in the mountains would be more peaceful and more enjoyable and there wouldn't be as many people. So a little bit less stress, maybe, you know, less people at the grocery store and things like that. So actually it ended up being a great move because it was really calm in the mountains. Um, in France, everyone has to have an attestation to go outside. So that's like essentially a piece of paper that says who you are, um, where you're going, uh, the date, you know, signed. Um, and so, yeah, there were a lot of people in the mountains just walking around like normal. And, you know, there weren't any really gendarme up there. So, you know, it was definitely a calmer place to be. And it was really not so bad. It was, it was, you know, okay, there weren't any more people skiing anymore, but uh, yeah, it was just really beautiful and calm and not the worst place to sit out for a while. But but yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's different when you're there with a friend um, and you're able to ride your bike every day than if you're stuck inside and, uh, you know, you can't really see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm still motivated to be as strong as I can be whenever the racing starts again. Um, and for some reason, I'm just really motivated in general right now, but, uh, maybe I should like try to keep that motivation for the coming months because I think it could be a long ride. So we'll see. Hopefully the weather's good enough. 
uh, at my parents or in my hometown uh, to ride outside. Otherwise, I'll just be stuck in the train or like everyone else, but we'll see. Lockdown with Larry, part three. Uh, I keep thinking of all the things I need to talk about, so we'll keep adding uh, as time goes on. But, yeah, I guess uh, a lot of people are probably curious how this is affecting our training and everything like that. And You know, I think there's a few ways to look at it. Our, our team, the general recommendations are, you know, to take a break for a week or two and then, you know, really start to build up after that because, you know, I mean, their eye is that uh, the racing will probably start end of May, maybe June. Um, I'm thinking with each coming day, that's less likely. And I wouldn't be surprised to see end of July or August um, before we really start. So I guess we'll see what happens with all of that. But my idea was more to continue training hard and uh, building up like... I had originally planned and then you know once we know a bit more take a break because I think for the moment the whole thing is it's like you know if you can ride outside if you can train and you can keep your motivation it's better to keep it for as long as you possibly can um, and then you know if that will probably wane at some point so <laughs> maybe take a break when uh, your motivation starts to wane and yeah, use your motivation while you have it. So um, I've been training pretty hard actually the last week and uh, I think I'll continue to do so when I get back to the US. Um, but then after that, uh, we'll see. Maybe try to do a good two to three week block and then from there just uh, take some time off for a little bit before building up again. So we'll see. I'll be flying after my altitude camp for chilling at home and eating my mom's cake. But, you know. Oh, well. Just before we wrap up for this week, this week's bumper episode, you can tell we've got a lot of time on our hands at the moment, eh? Um, hope, hopefully you do too, the listeners. You've got a special treat coming up, so do um, do stay tuned for that. But um, we are, we're hoping to uh, announce in the next couple of weeks a special treat for friends of the podcast you can still sign up as a friend of the podcast of course at the cyclingpodcast.com and if you order a book uh, the grand tour diaries are a book covering the 2018 and 2019 editions of those races our audio diaries from those editions um we are the post office is still open here we are still getting copies out um so if you'd like a copy of the book you can get one by uh, through our website or by becoming a, a good friend of the podcast you get a signed copy if you sign up as a good friend of the podcast just before we say thanks to some friends of the podcast um i thought i'd name a couple of um friends of the podcast who deserve special thanks tim roberts an nhs doctor who posted in our facebook discussion group and marcus banks an orthopedic surgeon in london who is well known to us because he he once got daniel to do a selfie with him wow uh, he also he also came on our world championships bike ride last year and a few years before that he replaced my hip but marcus got in touch with me this week as well just to say that um, you know, he was he was urging people not to ride in groups at the moment, uh, and that is the official government advice now as well. Um, but yeah, um, thanks to Tim Roberts and Marcus Banks, and thanks also to Del Ward, to Jeremy Conrad Pickles, to Colin Cheever, Gavin Bluck, Chris Boomer, Stuart Craig, Terry Muller, Stephen Lambert, Josh Dapis, and Charlie Richards. And thanks to Zuko Nonchuba, John Painter, Ian Williams, Alan Caitlin, Catlin, um, Stefan Dixon, Boyd Scott, Dave Smith, Mark Johnston, Anne Marie Plume, and Hugh Parker. And a big thank you to Joel Down, Andy Day, Ian Young, Damon Bowen Ashwin, Richard Mayo, Gareth Jones, Scott Charlton. Christopher Merstick, I hope that's correct, Charles King and Charles Twang. And playing us out this week, uh, hopefully this will be a regular feature, our good friend Francois Tomazo. When I said I needed you, it was 
said you wouldn't always stay It wasn't me who changed but you And now you've gone away Don't you see that now you've gone And I'm left here on my own That I have to follow you And beg you to come home You don't have to say you love me just because You don't have to stay forever And I will understand Believe me, believe me I can't help but love you But believe me, I'll never tie you down Left alone with just a memory Life seems dead and quite unreal All that's left is loneliness There's nothing left to feel You don't have to say you love me just because I Don't have to stay forever, I will understand Believe me, believe me You don't have to say you love me just because I am You don't have to stay forever, I will understand Believe me Yeah, I chose to um, I chose to play that song because it's actually an Italian song, uh, and it, it's maybe you know that, but uh, San Remo is is well known for uh, its cyclist a uh, cycling race, the, of course Milan San Remo, but it's also well known for a, an annual uh, song festival, the San Remo Festival, and. Uh, Uh, this song, uh, you don't, you don't have to say you love me, which was made very famous by Dusty Springfield and Elvis Presley, uh, was actually uh, written by a guy called Pino Donaggio, and it was a, a hit in uh, 1965 uh, called Lo Cheno Vivo. Um, and there you are. So this song was made popular by this this great. Uh, Song festival and Pino Donaggio is, is kind is kind of a very he's not you know uh, as famous as Nino Rota or you know other uh, Italian composers but he actually you know shot, composed lots of uh, uh, themes uh, for films and well notably for uh, Brian De Palma and uh, uh, for instance Dress to Kill or uh, you know uh, other lots of, and lots and lots of Italian movies I mean he he, uh, he wrote the film scores for that so a kind of a, a kind of a, maybe not the uh, first copy of uh, uh, Italian music but a, but a, a very solid uh, I don't know uh, Felice Gimondi maybe so there you are uh, there was a song for the day for Milan San Remo you don't have to say uh, you love me uh, and the Italian verse, version once again was called Lo che non vivo senza te by Pino Donaggio and Vito Paravicini, uh, recorded in 1966 by Dusty Springfield and later in 1971 by Elvis Presley, and now in 2020 by The Singing Podcast and François Tomaso. Have a good day, all. That's all for part one of this week's two-part episode. Part two is on the feed now. If you want to listen to it, you can do straight away. You've been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Tom Wally.